Hi there. I bet you have a lot of questions right now. Allow me to take the time to go through and speed around and answer those questions for you. Yes, I'm not in the office. That's probably very confusing for you, but I promise in another video I will explain everything. Number two, am I drinking? Next question. Uh, number three, is this the usual video? No, it's not, but that's okay. We'll discuss that more right now. In case you didn't know, I have a Discord link in the description, and that Discord has a fantasy football league. If you're from the CCFL, you probably already know what this is and you're very excited about it. So that's right, bitches. Let's get this shit started. CCFL power rankings each week on this channel, starting with the preseason rankings. All right, so this one might be perceived as a bit of a hot take, but Nick and Lewis are last place in 10th. On the surface level, you're probably looking at this team and saying, wow, this is actually a pretty good team. You got Dak Prescott, Brees Hall, Mike Evans, this is fantastic. Hey, look, you're absolutely right. Those are phenomenal players. However, we've got this one glaring issue right here. Rashad White. See, folks, Rashad White is wildly inefficient. And if you need proof, well, to quote Nickelback, Look at this graph! This graph right here shows Rashad White's production by situation, and it gives all sorts of different offensive plays that Rashad White would be rushing on compared to the rest of the league. Looking at this graph right now, we're really only going to focus on non-perfectly blocked plays and perfectly blocked plays. For the perfectly blocked plays, meaning everything the stars align perfectly for Rashad White, he is in the 25th percentile of the league, only getting 5.9 yards. That's wildly inefficient. And for all those dumbasses who come at me basically being like, oh, you know, he actually is a lot more efficient in other spots. On those non-perfectly blocked plays, you're absolutely right. He's in the 75th percentile, but he's only getting 2.9 fucking yards. Now, Nick and Lewis luckily do have Devon A. Chan, who's an explosive running back on a fast-paced offense. However, like all the other running backs in that running back room, they're highly injured prone. And there's a chance that he could be losing a ton of snaps to Raheem Mostert, who is just as good of a running back in that rotation. And then looking at this bench that we have here, Christian Watson is not the clear wide receiver one in Green Bay, so that poses a level of risk. DeAndre Hopkins is losing his wide receiver one spot to Calvin Ridley, who just got traded onto the team. And J.K. Dobbins is a running back by committee. And Aaron Rodgers, well, he's probably high somewhere, so we don't really give a shit about him. Could this team be something great? Sure, absolutely. However, I think it's gonna take a little bit more time to get there, and they're gonna need to fine tune it if they truly wanna compete this season. Coming in at number nine, and man, this is like really weird to actually do in front of a camera and talk about, but you got my team, the Legends of Smoky Valley. Now, I've kind of warmed up to this team since the draft in particular. I love the Joe Burrow pick. I love my wide receivers. I love pretty much every other spot. My real issue kind of comes right here in the running back room. The interesting part of this running back room is Joe Mixon. Because he's part of a Houston Texans team that's loaded with plenty of targets for CJ Stroud to throw the ball to. However, Bobby Slowick actually likes to rush the ball a bit more than I'd argue the Bengals did. So I do like the odds here. The real problem with this running back room is with Ramondre Stevenson. He's the best running back on a committee for a team that is absolute trash. I mean, did we all see that offensive line in the fucking preseason for the Patriots? That was horrendous. Outside of those running back issues, the rest of this team is actually in pretty good shape. A.J. Brown and Garrett Wilson are high-end wide receiver ones, especially now that Aaron Rodgers is back to throw the ball to Wilson. You've got Mark Andrews, who's beloved by Lamar Jackson and was his number one target for a consistent period of time. I like the opportunity that I have there. And D.K. Metcalf has Mike McDonald as his brand new head coach who loves targeting the wide receiver one when he was the offensive coordinator for the Ravens. The reason why this team is ninth and not 10th, despite the fact that this week, this team started in the 10th place spot, has to do with the changes around the running back room. Blake Corum might actually take a few more snaps away from Kyron Williams than we originally suspected. Tyler Algier is one of the best bruiser backs in the NFL, if not the best, and should get some good opportunities with this new Falcons offense. And Tajay Spears is fighting for that running back one position with Tony Pollard, who did not look great as the running back one last year for the Cowboys. 
Right now, I'm stuck towards the bottom, but if we know anything from last year, I have all the time in the world to climb up from here. Now, I bet Maria and Kelly are sitting there saying to themselves, Tom, you said our draft was good. I did say your draft was good. However, there were just seven other teams that drafted better than you. Starting off with Josh Allen, I do like Josh Allen as a quarterback. However, the fact that he doesn't have a clear wide receiver one does concern me. Hopefully the stack with Dalton Kincaid can work well, but you did miss out on quite a bit of opportunity drafting Josh Allen as the first quarterback off the board. In terms of your running back room, it's pretty decent. DeAndre Swift is a fantastic pickup. Like Joe Mixon, I would argue that he's in a loaded wide receiver room with the potential to take up a good majority of the rushing attack for the Bears offense. And he has the added pass catch ability that I would argue Joe Mixon doesn't have as much that makes him a real potential threat as your RB1. Now Raheem Mostert, as we talked about previously with Devon Achan, is a little bit of a risk because he has a long history of injury. And if that long history of injury kind of comes into play, we end up getting this guy. Meet Jalen Wright, the third best running back in the 2024 draft class. And the Miami Dolphins traded up to go get this guy after having two injury-prone running backs. If that doesn't scream replacement, I don't know what does. Now, Tyreek Hill was a perfect first-round pick. It landed right in your spot. You guys drafted him. Didn't do anything wrong there. My issue kind of comes up with these other two wide receivers, Chris Olave and Brandon Ayuk. Chris Olave is the lead target for the Saints, and he's wildly talented, but in terms of his situation, I have a lot of concerns, particularly with Dennis Allen potentially being on his way out of the door. If he leaves midseason, I think that's going to create a lot of culture problems for the Saints. As a backup option, you do have Brandon Ayuk, but the risk coming into the season with him not having a guaranteed contract was a rather large one just to go out and draft him as high as you guys ended up taking him. With that being said, luckily he signed that contract, so you should be good to go there. I just don't know how much he's really truly going to be used in that offense now that we're getting more and more pieces fitting into the mix. It's do or die for the 49ers, and we'll have to see how that plays out. Moving on over to this bench, you do have great options with Jackson Smith and Jake, and Jake Ferguson, who in particular, Ferguson is going to be that lead target for the first couple weeks with C.D. Lamb kind of rotating back into the mix for things. Jackson Smith and Jigba, of course, being the wide receiver three on an absolutely loaded Seahawks offense that we could see a lot more pass game open up since there's three fantastic receivers there. However, the real issue with this draft and the reason why you're so low really kind of comes in right here and then right here. That's a defense and a kicker. That's a defense and a kicker. You don't need two. You just need one. And I don't understand the whole reasoning as to why to double up. Jake Moody is nowhere near the same level as Harrison Butker. So there should have never been a discussion in which Jake Moody was ever getting picked in those later rounds. And the Eagles defense is just like another added defense. They may work week one since the Chiefs are playing the Ravens, but beyond that, there really isn't that much hype to bring both of those defenses and both of those kickers. My hope is, is that they'll drop one of the sets of those teams relatively soon. As a whole, if Marie and Kelly take away the excess and trade around to kind of secure up those problematic areas in their starting lineup, I think they could actually be a true contender this year. Coming in at number seven, we have Tristan. He's a decent starting lineup with a good bit of potential on the bench. Starting off at quarterback, we have Anthony Richardson. I like Anthony Richardson, but we don't have a ton of data on him as a whole right now. He only played a small portion of the season last year, and he had some very nice flashes during that small portion, but the injury bug left him out the remainder of the season, and that poses some risk going into this season as well. Isaiah Pacheco and Kenneth Walker are not spectacular running backs, but they're certainly serviceable running backs, and that level of stability that you're gonna get from those two might actually be a really good thing for this team. The real risk you run into is right here with Jamar Chase. You see, Jamar Chase, you knew coming into the draft, didn't secure a contract, and was holding out for a good portion of training camp. Well, things got worse once Zach Taylor basically said, yeah, he's gonna be playing week one. Right now, there's no sign whatsoever that Jamar Chase is gonna be starting week one, let alone playing at all. 
And that potentially could continue on later into the season, but the Bengals would need to figure something out by week five, or else they're gonna be in real trouble for their season. As for your fantasy team, your wide receiver one, your first round pick, is basically a big old goose egg for the time being until the Bengals can figure some shit out with Jamar Chase. Nothing's guaranteed with him whatsoever. Despite all the issues with Jamar Chase, you at least still have Nico Collins, who's in a stacked wide receiver room, but the Texans have made it clear that he's the wide receiver one. And if you don't like that option, you also have Amari Cooper, who's considered to be one of the safest, if not the safest wide receiver in all of fantasy football. The man is straight consistent, has been averaging like 10 points since kingdom fucking come. You got Trey McBride on this offense, who's poised to pop off this season, being one of the top options for Kyler. Now this is a decent starting lineup, but it's in complete stark contrast to the potential that you have on the bench. Starting off at the top, you've got Rashi Rice, who could be facing a suspension for all the shenanigans that happened in Dallas. And let me tell you, I don't believe any of that fucking bullshit that that's just gonna somehow slide. Like, the man literally caused an eight mile pile up on the tollway. There's just no way he's gonna get away with that shit. Brian Thomas Jr. was an underrated wide receiver coming out of college due to the fact that he had Malik neighbors in the same wide receiver room at LSU. However, he's joining a Jacksonville Jaguars team that has Christian Kirk and all the opportunity in the world for him to take over as the lead target for the Jags. I don't need to say much about Caleb Williams. He was the top prospect coming into this draft and was taken by an absolutely loaded Bears offense. The question is whether or not he's going to be good for this team. It's whether or not he's going to take the Bears to the promised land. And Tristan, I know this slide was made long before all the shenanigans that happened with Ricky Pearsall and the Pew Pew and all that chaos. But I imagine you'll add him back at some point and he'll be a completely serviceable flex option for you on this team. Tristan has to hope that this bench built on rookies and potential can pan out in such a way that he can start rotating him into a starting lineup and this team can seriously become deadly towards the end of the season. The Atlanta Zone of Falinals have the potential to be a really good team and are sitting in the sixth place spot. However, it's all completely contingent on how the Redbirds do in their respective divisions. The Falcons are poised to go run away and win their division with Kirk Cousins as the starting quarterback sitting here on the bench, along with B. John Robinson, Drake London, and Kyle Pitts. And let's not forget this Falcons defense who just added Matthew Judon and Justin Simmons. That's gonna be a great set of options for this team. On the other side of things, you have the Arizona Cardinals who are set to be last in their division, but that won't stop Marvin Harrison Jr. from being the top target in that offense and is probably gonna get used very heavily over the course of this season. You also have Trey Benson, who could potentially take over as the lead back if James Conner ends up getting injured, but that's all up to speculation. Outside of those two teams, you have three players that can make an impact. Starting off with Jalen Hurts, he is one of the top quarterbacks going in these drafts, and he's a fantastic passing and rushing threat. I just don't know how well the tush push is really gonna do now that Jason Kelsey's out of the picture. In terms of running backs, you have Tony Pollard, who's on a new team with a new head coach and a new system in play. However, he wasn't a fantastic lead running back for the Cowboys, and that may pose an issue with Tajay Spears, who's already on the team, potentially usurping that role away from Pollard at any point in time. And to wrap things up in the flex spot, we have T Higgins, who's currently the wide receiver one for the Bengals now that Jamar Chase is looking to hold out for the early portion of the year. I think this is actually a really good situation for Higgins to show that he is a wide receiver one level talent, which may open some doors for him for his future and obviously stack up the fantasy points early on this season for Tyler. Tyler can have a really, really good team this year, but it's all completely contingent on those two teams hitting on every single one of their players. And I'm not so sure that he can maintain that level of consistency across the board with both the Falcons and the Cardinals. Nika and to an extent Otto have an absolutely fantastic lineup loaded with tons of talent. The problem comes in with a lot of questionable situations. In terms of fantasy points, Mahomes should be fine despite the fact that he doesn't have a star wide receiver one. And for Christian McCaffrey, well, Christian McCaffrey is the lead offensive player for the 49ers. So that should easily be a lock for some good fantasy points. 
the issues start to pop up with a guy like Derrick Henry, who has a history of being injury prone, but is now on a team like the Ravens, who like to rush the ball since they have a quarterback like Lamar Jackson, who's a good rushing threat. I think Herrick will come in, take a lot of those rushing threats away from Jackson, and it may open up the offense for Henry to be a little bit more efficient and Lamar Jackson to throw the ball a little bit more. In terms of the wide receivers, we got two talented wide receivers with Michael Pittman Jr. and Cooper Cup, but Pittman is going to be struggling if Anthony Richardson gets injured. That fantasy value is going straight down the tank. And then Cooper Cup is going to be fighting for targets with Puka Nakua, and we just have to hope that Matthew Stafford can distribute the ball evenly to all the different mouths he has to feed in that offense. With Brandon Ayuk signing with the 49ers, that may relegate George Kittle back into that blocking tight end position, which would hurt his fantasy value. And then you've got George Pickens, who's in an even worse situation than Michael Pittman Jr. Because while Michael Pittman Jr. may have the potential of injury with Anthony Richardson, at least Anthony Richardson's a quarterback, right? George Pickens has Russell fucking Wilson, Fucking Broncos country, Steelers nation, let's ride Russell fucking Wilson. That guy's ass. He's not going to be good this year. The Steelers nation is in a tough fucking spot with him. And George Pickens has to pray that Justin Fields can rotate into the starting lineup and be a decent enough quarterback to throw him the ball. And that's the way he's going to get good fantasy points. I don't like George Pickens, even though he's the lead target in Pittsburgh. Now they do have Christian Kirk, who is a potential option to replace any of the wide receivers in this lineup. He is currently slated as the wide receiver one for the Jags now that Zay Jones and Calvin Ridley are out of the picture. So that could become a potential option if he gets good targets and uses those targets very efficiently. You also have Zach Carbonet as a backup running back. I don't think he's the best option available for you. You don't really have much beyond Zach Carbonet in that backfield there, but I'm gonna go ahead and just use my CNN skills to highlight the glaring issue. You see, we'll just go ahead and go like that. You see, John King, that is how you emphasize something on the magic wall. Maybe you should be taking some lessons from Mr. Enton, you dumbo. All right, Nika, yeah, 49ers, not the best pickup. I know you were trying to piss me off with that one, and I'll give you your claps for that one right there. Anyways, I'm done with you. I'll see you at work tonight. For an auto draft, I think Sarah's actually poised to be in a really, really, really good position. Starting off at the top, you have the best dual threat quarterback in the NFL, Lamar Jackson. And yes, he's going to be losing some of those rushes over to Derrick Henry. However, I think that'll open him up in the passing game and make him a bigger elite threat. In the running back room, you have Kyron Williams and Travis Etienne. I love Etienne. He's one of the best pass catching backs in the NFL. That was a fantastic pickup for the auto draft to grab. Kyron Williams, on the other hand, he's also very good, but the risky run with Kyron Williams in particular is that now since he's the punt returner, that risk of injury is gonna be elevated. I'm not sure that the snaps necessarily are going to be decreased on the offensive side due to the punt returning, but that risk of injury is certainly gonna be elevated. In the wide receiver room, you have two fantastically talented wide receivers though it won't look great week one. C.D. Lamb is going to be sitting out week one because he just signed a contract, hasn't been in training camp. He needs to get readied up for the season, so he's going to be sitting out week one. And Malik Neighbors is poised to be one of the best rookie wide receivers. However, it comes with the caveat that he's got Daniel fucking Jones throwing him the ball, so that may not be the best thing in the world. We'll just have to wait and see on him in particular. The worst spot on this team by far has to come with Pat Fryermuth, and there's two reasons as to why. The first reason is because there is no other tight end option on this team. If Fryermuth gets injured, Sarah's going to free agency and hoping she can find somebody as good. On the other hand, you also have the potential of Pat Fryermuth not being one of the top options in Pittsburgh. They do have a very good rush game. They do have a very good wide receiver in George Pickens. He may be kind of lower down on the target share, and you just have to hope that he has that red zone upside in order to make him viable. Moving on to the flex spot, you've got Calvin Ridley, who I actually really like. He's going to become the wide receiver one in a Tennessee team with Will Levis as their quarterback. 
Will Levis, being the mayo-eating motherfucker that we all know and love, is getting a new head coach, a new system, and this could be a sleeper team to pull off some crazy upsets, especially in a competitive division like the AFC South. So I think there's a lot of good high fantasy point value for Calvin Ridley, and he's a nice substitute to have for a wide receiver. Moving on to the bench, you've got Chris Godwin, who's a high-end wide receiver too, especially with not much changing in that offense in Tampa Bay. It's a weaker division, the NFC South. I think there's a lot of really great potential for Chris Godwin this year. And looking over at Jordan Love, man, what's there not to love about Jordan Love? He was an unbelievable quarterback last year. He's got a lot of the same pieces. He's got a great offensive mind in Matt LaFleur. He's going to be a fantastic backup quarterback for this team. Now, it would be remiss if I didn't highlight the elephant in the room of Najee Harris and Jalen Warren. Having an auto draft accomplish creating a running back stack for the Steelers is quite frankly something that's just unheard of. With that being said, there is still a big looming enemy here in this room that could prevent them from getting a lot of fantasy point value. Regardless of that enemy, Sarah is poised to be in a position to start the season off strong and could potentially, with some tweaking, become a dark horse contender for the haulers later in the season. JP is once again coming in with his is going to be coming into the season at number three. Gibbs and Laporta as a stack is an unbelievable setup for yourself, and I really think Gibbs has the potential to have a breakout season this year. Alvin Kamara is the most stable thing in the Saints' office, so having him as your RB2 is a great thing. Now, this wide receiver room does bring me a little bit of concern. Justin Jefferson starting off has Sam Darnold throwing him the ball, and I have to wonder how good truly Sam Darnold is. Going over to Debo Samuel, he's obviously in a loaded roster in the 49ers, and he's a little bit of a fake wide receiver, more of a running back, so he has the potential to get injured very quickly and has the history for it. And then you have Tank Dell, who's going to be in a 2A, 2B situation with Stephon Diggs. That may not be great for his target share. But if you were ever concerned about that, we can take a look at this bench. You've got a lot of potential options to replace. You've got Xavier Worthy, Roma Dunze, who are potential great wide receiver options to replace in that room. And then you've got Aaron Jones, who's just the perfect replacement for a guy like Debo Samuel, because we all know that Debo Samuel will get injured and you can throw Aaron Jones in there because fuck all the rules with football, I guess. You also have Jaden Daniels, who's the number two overall pick. I don't really know how he's going to be. I have no clue where to expect the commies to end up. But if Justin Herbert doesn't pan out for you in terms of Jim Harbaugh's offense, Jaden Daniels may be the pick to go with. All in all, I think this is exactly what we expect from JP. A high quality team that's ready to compete for the whole season. Warren was in a prime position to take the top spot in these preseason rankings. However, a few issues ultimately left him at number two. Starting off with the positive, we've got CJ Stroud, who is a great quarterback on a Houston Texans team that now has more offensive options for him. It's only just going to get better. That was a great pickup for Warren. To add on to that, you've got Amon Ross St. Brown and Devontae Adams, which is an unbelievable one-two punch to have for your wide receiver duo. However, there's two issues, one major and one minor, that prevent me from giving this team the top spot. Starting off with the minor issue is Zay Flowers. I know you told me to get Zay Flowers on my other fantasy football team, and I did, but I still have some issues with Zay Flowers. The big one being, I think people are undervaluing this Derrick Henry signing. I think the Ravens are going to rush the ball a lot more now that they've got a very clear, high quality running back in that offense. I think things are going to also revert back now that Mike McDonald has left the organization. This may open the doors to a classical Ravens throwing the ball to Mark Andrews and rushing the ball up the middle like they did with Derrick Henry, and they hope that he just doesn't get injured. So Zay Flowers may end up with less activity, but you do have Cortland Sutton, who if Bo Nix can pan out as a good quarterback, may be a great wide receiver one option to be throwing into the fold. Now the major issue comes when you start looking at the bench. You see these three players here, 
Two out of these three players are actually on the pup list, so they're not going to be starting anytime soon. And James Conner has a history of injury. When you combine that with Saquon Barkley and Josh Jacobs, this situation goes from being a top tier contending team to the potential for a general fucking hospital. There's a lot of high risk, high reward here for Warren, but I like to err on the side of team positivity and think that things are going to pan out well, which is the reason why Warren's stuck at number two. Coming in at the top spot, we have former CCFL champion, Mr. Zach Murawski. Now, is this team perfect? Hell no, but is it pretty damn good? Absolutely. Jonathan Taylor and James Cook is a wonderful one-two punch for that running back room. I really like the options you have there. And let's not forget Travis Kelsey, who is the lead target for Patrick Mahomes and just is an unbelievable tight end, clearly the top tight end in the NFL right now. So having him on this team, I mean, you're already looking great. I actually really like this wide receiver room of Puka Nakua and DJ Moore, despite the concerns that people may have. DJ Moore is going to be the clear wide receiver one, given the fact that he's been in the system the longest and is slowly starting to enter into his prime. He now has a very good quarterback with Caleb Williams. The opportunities are endless for DJ Moore. Now with Puka Nakua, I understand people's concerns with Cooper Cup rotating into the mix and it being a wide receiver 1A, 1B situation there. However, with Kyron Williams becoming the punt returner, for the Rams, this is going to open up a lot of opportunities for Matt Stafford to throw the ball because they're not going to have their star running back consistently rushing on every single play. So I think there's a lot more passing opportunities for Puka, which may even out the share for both Cooper and Puka in the long run. Looking over towards this bench position, you basically got people who either have the opportunity to be lead options or take away opportunities from other players. Like for example, Jaden Reed is poised to be the lead wide receiver one. Same with Jerry Judy. But you've also got people like David Montgomery, who's going to take snaps away from Jameer Gibbs, or Cole Komet, who's going to take away red zone targets from all the other wide receivers in that Bears offense. So I really love that bench in terms of its potential. Zach is locked in at the top spot, but that doesn't mean that he has the full potential just yet. Keep in mind, he could trade really any of these players and have so many different assets to really improve his team. Let's use Puka Nakua, for example. If Puka Nakua doesn't really pan out over the course of the season, Jaden Reed might be able to, or Jerry Judy, David Montgomery, maybe even DJ Moore. You have a lot of options that you can rotate in and out that either these options can be put into the lineup or you can take these pieces pair it all together and then go make a ridiculous trade for a high-end wide receiver one. The options are endless for Zach, which is why he's in the top spot. So to round things off, we've got Zach, Warren, JP, Sarah, Nika and Otto, Tyler, Tristan, Marie and Kelly, myself, and then at the very end, last, but most certainly not least, Nick and Lewis. And with that, I conclude the 2024 CCFL preseason rankings. It was a lot of fun to write and even more fun to record. I just don't really know how it's going to turn out. This is a fun little experiment. If you enjoyed this format, please make sure to give this video a thumbs up. And if you weren't the biggest fan of it, no worries. I still have the Google Slides presentation down in the description below. Make sure to subscribe and turn on the post notification bell to join the bridge gang. And while you're at it, comment down below what you thought of my rankings. Should some teams be higher? Should some teams be lower? Let me know. Normal programming will return this Friday, so please stay tuned for that. And thank you guys so much for watching this video. I will see you all next time. Bye! Hi, folks. If Ryan Reynolds can do this post credit scene, so can I. So let's take a look back at the footage. JP is once again coming in with his annoying, stupid, Birmingham, giddy up, fuckhead, 15 year old twink ass having too much fucking knowledge and too much fucking skill for his age is going to be coming into the season at number three.